Uh, today we're going to talk about the miracle of provision. And this is a week I have been waiting for because it's the easiest one to preach. Because it's the one that God answers so many times over and over and over again. My entire life, from even before I was born, is a miracle of God's provision in my life. I have never seen God delay. I had an aunt that was always afraid. She lived in, through the Depression. She was, you know, in midlife during the Depression. And um, she, her, the promise she would hold to was, I've never seen um, God's people forsaken or their children begging bread. And she would hold on to that, hold on to that. You know, that's kind of a negative, you know. <laughs> there you go. Don't let the worst thing happen to me, please. But I'll tell you, even in her life, she had a rough life. Even in her life, she saw that promise carried out in such a powerful way, in such a true way. And she, even though she uh, was not a lady of great means, she, her generosity was multiplied by God in ways, and this, you have to go back 30, 40 years, in ways that are still blessing people today. And, um, and so I've seen this miracle of provision over and over. Some people say, oh, pastor, aren't you afraid of preaching on money? No, I am not afraid of preaching on money at all. I am not here to put anything about money as far as this. What I'm saying is we all care about money. We're all interested. We all have our fears about it. And God has a solution. God has a way to live in this economic world. Human beings have always had in civilization some form of, of economy, some form of money. God, that's, that's part of our human existence is money. And it has been in every culture and every, uh, every age. And here it is for us today. And in the same way, God has biblical principles for us to understand. The problem with money is this. We choose to trust money instead of God. We might not have enough money, or maybe we have too much money, whatever it is, but we, we, we kind of make money a God. God, my money, God, will solve all my problems. We're told that by, by uh, dumb people. And, and sometimes we're dumb enough to believe it. And that's one of the things that keeps us from living in the position and the posture of God's blessing for us. And so I want to share these biblical principles I can tell you from the bottom of my heart that I know, that I know, that I know, and every experience that I've had and what I've seen with other people, everything I share with you today is true. It is true, true, true. It always has been, always will be. This is the truth. Um, the, number, the first principle I want to share with you is this. In every story of need, there is a miracle of provision. In every story of need, anytime there has been a need, God provides a miracle of provision every single time. In big ways and in small ways. I had a small way this week that just shocked me. Um, Army's in school. School's expensive. We're tightening our belts. Unfortunately, I wish that were true. I hope I would be. It'd be nice if I could lose weight during this phase, but I probably won't. I'll gain weight because I eat when I'm nervous. And um, But, you know, we're trying to figure it all out. One of my luxury expenses for the last three years has been French classes. And you say, why are you taking French? I really don't know. <laughs> but... Um, I take this, I really think it's a God thing. For some reason, every time I think about quitting, I just feel God just, no, don't quit. Just keep going, keep going. And I do. Now, now it's kind of expensive. It costs me about $400 a month. And I've been happy. Everything's been going well. But it's not easy. And, I, and I'm wondering, well, how am I going to do with that, you know? And, um, and so this week, out of the blue, my French teacher calls me up and, or texts me. And, and she says that um, the school where I've been going, um, they want her to teach me outside of the school. My guess is because I'm an only student, and so I take up a room, and they'd probably like to have more students in a room rather than just one. And she said, and she said hey, if you let me teach you at the Cupertino Library, um, I'll, I'll charge you half, and I'll make more because they take more out of what you pay them. I said, that sounds like a really good deal. <laughs> And so I took it, and I went and had my first French class at the Cupertino Library. And let me tell you what, I just sit there and marvel at the timing. Anybody could say, well, that was bound to happen anyways. Not when you're in it, it wasn't. It hasn't happened in three years. Why did it happen just when I'm asking God, how am I going to do this, God? How is this going to be possible? And it's just another confirmation to me of God saying, I've got this. You just continue to live and trust in me and let me carry you forward. I will take care of everything. Thank you, God. 
I remember a couple years ago, my mom was uh, in a nursing home, and we were not happy with the nursing home that she went to. A lot of nursing homes are, can be really bad places. I can't say this was one of the bad ones, but it wasn't one of the good ones. But her doctor was there, and her doctor insisted that she go there, and that's where he made his rounds, and blah, blah, blah. And so we went. We went that route. And we were kind of nervous about it, putting mom in a, not a great nursing home. And Although we didn't have a lot of options, you know, we don't have a lot of money. So there we were. And um, we start praying. And I don't know what we're praying. We're just praying that God would protect my mom in that home. And, and God would provide for my mom in that home. That nursing home had a two out of five star rating. Not great. And you know what happened? They changed directors. Very soon. We're, we're talking months. Within a matter of months, they changed directors. And next thing we know, it got up to three stars. And then we're looking around saying, you know what? This place is getting a lot nicer. All of a sudden, the nurses were a lot nicer and things, food's getting better and they're painting the place and making changes. Four stars. And we're like, wow, this, this is amazing. <laughs> Look at what's happening. There's only six nursing homes in California that have a five star rating with this uh, committee that oversees this. And a few months after the four star, they came in and put the five star on there. And it was a fantastic nursing home. And I thought, look how God provided. Look how God, we went to this. That's so far out of our means, isn't it? So far out of our system of control. But look at God watching out for my mother. Goes in there, well, if you guys can't afford it, you know, you can't go to, uh, I don't want to say go to the mountain because, you know, it's a Christian church. But, uh, but the point is, God comes to you <laughs> and God takes care of you. And I thought, look at how God does this. Where does it happen? Where does that? It happens when you trust God, when you live right with God and you live in that relationship and you understand and you're comfortable with God's economy, how he does things. And that's the first thing. The first I want to share with you guys is uh, Philippians 4, 19. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. I want to tell you, for us who live by this verse, who live by this principle, that wherever there's a need, there's a miracle provision, we tell you this verse is true. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. God will meet all of your needs. This is the second principle I want to share with you. Why, should, why I should choose to trust God to provide. Now, I'm going to tell you, when I was making, writing this sermon, I prayed a lot about these, and I, I wrote why I should trust God to provide. And so I came up with all my points, and I'll share these points with you. But it started to bug me. Why should I trust? Because a lot of us don't have an innate uh, understanding of just trust because we have choices. So I added the words to choose. Why should I choose to trust God to provide? Now, there's a, a significant key right there. Why should I choose? Because I don't have to choose God. I'll be okay. I have a really good job. I'll be fine. I don't have to trust God. And there is the first trip in life. There's, there's where you're going to start falling down when you don't choose to trust God. And that's the point that I want to share with you guys. It's very important that regardless of our financial position, whether doing well or not doing well, regardless, it's important. The most important thing is not, do I have enough money? The most important thing is, do I choose to trust God? Is that clear? Do I choose to trust God? That's the posture that every child of God needs to be in, where we put ourselves in that boat. So, just to answer that first question, why should I choose to trust God to provide for me? Well, I would say the number one reason is because when you choose to trust God, you draw close to God and God draws close to you. It would be possible for you to live your entire life coming to church, giving generously, whatever all that is, but never be close to God. That's kind of scary, isn't it? But that's the story of a lot of people. But when you choose to trust God, you make that decision. Say, I'm going to depend on God. I'm going to put this in God's hands. You know what? <laughs> you become very aware of who God is and where God is and what he's doing. And you draw close to him and God draws close to you. I would say that is the number one reason to choose to trust God. Because you are drawing close to God and God is drawing closer. You live more solidly and, 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 and more amply in the presence of God. 
I would say that's certainly number one. Number two certainly isn't is a, a, a too far second to it all. And that's because when you choose to trust God, you are making God number one in your life. You are making God the first priority in your life. What you're saying is my first allegiance is to God. My second allegiance might be to my wife or my job, whatever, you know, whatever, however you want to number those. But number one is God. Number one is God. I heard somebody say recently that, that uh, the tithe is not 10%. The tithe is ten, the first 10%. And I thought, wow, I like that because the priority is not on the 10%. The priority is on the first. Who is first in your life? We'll come back to that idea. The third idea to it, the third reason why I should choose to trust God is because in reality and in eternity and in the truth of it, it all belongs to God anyways. It's all God. God enables us to be healthy enough. God enables us to have the mind. God enables us to have the skills necessary to learn to receive. It's all dependent on God. We should never underestimate that. It all belongs to God. This is how God is functioning in his economy. And since he owns it all, since he is, is, is distributing it, and as he is apportioning it to us and asking us to manage it according to his ways, you know what? I can do that. I can choose to trust God because it's his anyways. The good Lord gives, the good Lord takes away. Regardless, it is God's money. I understand that principle. And the fourth one isn't so bad either. It's not too far down the list at all. I, would, I don't know how they all cram together at number in the second place, but they do. And I would say this. When you choose to trust God, what you do, you end up doing is living expectantly. Living expectantly. I love living expectantly. It's not easy for me to live expectantly. I like, just like many of you, I like what's, uh, what's guaranteed. I like what's sure. I want the sure bet. But when you live the Christian life, when you live as a follower of Jesus, we live expectantly looking for what God is going to do. What are you going to do, God? I know what I can do, and it's not enough. But what you can do is enough. God, what are you going to do? Every day of the week, I pray for God's presence to be here in the service in a powerful way, for God to do more than what the music can do, for God to do more than what friendly smiles and, and good friends can do, to do more than what a, a poor message can do, to do more. What does that mean? That means that God himself would be at work in your heart, changing and transforming your heart and your mind. That's what we talk about, living expectantly. What are we expecting God to do? God, God, what we expect God to do is over and beyond what we are able to do together. What only God can do. And let me tell you, that is a great way to live. That's the way that God has designed us to live in our relationship with, is to give room for God. Let God step in. Let God do his thing. When you learn to live expectantly, you learn to live with confidence because you learn that God is faithful, that God is good, and you learn that over and over, and you begin to see a much bigger world. You stop asking yourself, what can I do? And you start asking yourself, what can God do? Oh, that's a nice way to live. What a big picture that gives. What, what a freeing way that that is to live. What can God do when you live expectantly to that? And here's the, the, the fourth one I want to share with you. It's not about how much you give. It's about your heart. It's about the condition of your heart. Where is your heart in this whole thing? Because God wants you to be joyful in participating in his economy, doing what you need to do, giving proportional to how you are able to give, but make sure your heart is giving for the right reasons. That's what really matters. Not under compulsion, as we read, but joyfully, cheerfully, giving as a worship to God. God, here is a little that I'm trusting you to do what you can do with it, which is always a lot for you to bless this. Have your heart right before. That's, that is the most difficult. It's much easier to give a quantity of money than it is to give a smaller of money, but have the right heart, but have the right heart. That's what the call is, to make sure that we are right with God, that we have planned, this is how we're going to live, this is what we're going to do before the money comes in. This, these are the decisions I'm making. This is how we're going to use it. Have your heart right before God. Have your heart right before. That, that is so important um, as we live this Christian life. And the verse I want to share with you guys is 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 11. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion 
and through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Why should I choose to trust God to provide? Because you, God, will always make sure that you have enough to share with others. He will always make sure that you have enough to share with us. That's how God's economy is. God will always bless us in that way. He, he cares deeply that his children work together and, and, and work in partnership with each other. And every child is important to God. And he makes sure that everybody has their proper allowance, if you will, in that sense. Here's the third principle I want to share with you. God miraculously multiplies what is given. Oh, oh boy, is this one true? God miraculously, well, they're all true. This one is also true. <laughs> God miraculously multiplies what is given. He miraculously multiplies what is given. If you want to go to the Bible, you can go to the Jewish Bible and read amazing stories of how faithful God is. If you want to go to the Christian Bible, the New Testament, go to the Christian Bible. Read stories all the way through of how faithful God is. A favorite story that we have in the Old Testament, the Jewish Bible, is what? It's the story of Elisha and the widow. And she was getting ready. There's a terrible famine in the land. and She had nothing. She was getting ready to, to go. She had just a little bit of oil. And she tells the, the prophet, I've got nothing. Uh, me and my son, we're going to take this oil, make something out of it, and then we're just going to sit back and starve. That's just the way it is. And Elisha says, oh, no, no. Give me some oil. Give, give, and then you go and you get as many jars from your neighbors that you can and come back and out of your original jar, you just start pouring oil into these empty jars. And what was the story? It never ran. The last drop happened when the last jar she had borrowed was filled. And that's how God is every single time over and over and over. We just see these. It's not before. It's not before. Wouldn't all of us like it to be before we need the money? It's not. It's as we need the money, God provides in miraculous ways. God provides. It was a story in, in, in the Christian Bible, the, the New Testament. What do we have? We have Jesus with the feeding the 5,000. People are, are very hungry. Their stomachs are growling. Things are not going well. What are we going to do to feed these people? And what does Jesus say? Who do we have here? Who can give something? And now we got nothing. Oh, come on, you got to have something. And here's a little boy, a little boy, and his poor. Who would take food away from a little boy? Isn't that a terrible thing? Who would take food from a little boy when, you know, you got 5,000 other people who didn't cook anything, weren't prepared for this? No, let the little boy have his lunch. That's why I was not chosen as a disciple. And, um, but that would have been my thing, but not with Jesus. What was Jesus' thing? You bring, bring the little boy in his lunch here. He's, two fish and five loaves. And what did Jesus do? He multiplied it and fed everybody. He multiplied. After the giving, after the giving, after the giving. Why, why is it that God does that after the giving? Why? Because it sets, it postures our hearts right before God. It says this, this is a person who trusts in God, who does not trust himself. Many times I've come across situations in my own life and in the churches I've pastored and the people that I talk to, the people who have trusted me to, to have inside information into the difficulties of their lives. Many, many times I've heard of situations and I myself have thought, you know, God, we wouldn't be in this position if this person just had enough money. Why don't you just have enough money? That way these problems are all taken care of to begin with. Why don't you supply us with enough money so that when the need comes, we, we don't go bug people about it or deal with it or stress out. It's always about we don't have enough. Boy, what a dumb way to live. What a dumb way to live. Because the way that it's structured is that we have to have faith in God, to trust in God. Then God supplies. Then you realize how good God is and how faithful God is. That's how it is. That's, that's how God gives us so that we can test him and watch what he does and watch how he provides. And what does it do? It draws us closer to him. It draws us closer. It draws us to, to, to knowing that he is number one in our lives. He has first priority. He's the one that loves us and cares about. He's the one that owns everything. He's the one that takes care of absolutely it all. He is the one that we can expectantly wait on, trust him in big ways. He always comes through. He's the one that keeps my heart right with him. That's, that's the system that God has. That's the program and the relationship that we have with God is to trust him in those ways. So, so boy, is that true? God miraculously multiplies what is given, Mo miraculously multiplies what is given. 
I personally, I know not everybody agrees with me, I absolutely love living here in Silicon Valley. I count it as one of the great privileges of being alive in 2019. I know there's 7 billion people who do not live in Silicon Valley, and I feel bad for every single one of those. Every once in a while, I meet somebody who doesn't want to live here, and I, I think, they're so dumb. And um, I don't say that, right? <laughs> Sometimes I do. But I really, this, to me, this is the, the most uh, blessed city. This, this city, has, is, is stuff goes on here that changes the world. God has his children in this city. God is, it's like Elijah. Nobody's following me. Nobody cares. And what does God say to Elijah? Oh, I've got thousands that haven't bended their knee to Baal, buddy. And I find that everywhere I look, everywhere I go, God has his children, his people in there working in one way or the other, working to, to spread his good word. I think this place is just so, so exciting in that way. I absolutely love, absolutely love, uh, the love living here. I love the stories. I love listening to podcasts. You know, how I built this is usually a Silicon Valley story. And, and um, Stanford's entrepreneur leadership is always a, 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 a tech story. I love these stories. And they inevitably always talk about an idea that came about. And then the idea went as far as it could on a limited budget. And then they go talk to the venture capitalists. And then the venture capitalists, they go through tons and tons of venture capitalists. And finally, they come to one who says, yes, I'll invest. And when they invest, you know, the first round of investment is big already. But then there's more coming. If you reach these benchmarks, you know, we've got another $100 million for you. And on it goes. There's always more. But what happens? What happens? What would happen if I went over to Sand Hill Road and, and went into it and says, you know, if I had $10 million, I could come up with a really Really good idea, right? What would the receptionist do? She would call security on me. Get out of here, you idiot. That's not how it works, right? And that's the same thing with God. We can't come to God without a need because God, he honors our needs. He, he's watching our hearts. He's asking what we're looking for. He understands our hearts are right with him. He's looking for something. And what do we have? We have a need. And what is God's economy? What's God's coin? Need. If you have need, God gets excited. If you come to God with a need, God is there saying, oh, I've been looking for somebody who needs me. This is really good. Come to God can do amazing things when we need God to do amazing things. That's why someday I'm going to pastor in a black church where they'll all say amen when I say something like that. <laughs> but that is the truth. God uses our needs. Need to us living in the world is a, uh, is a uh, it's not a good thing. It's not a good thing. We, we want to all be people who don't have a need. Oh, I don't know how you can't live in the kingdom of God if you don't have need. <laughs> you have to have need. You have to have, because that's God's currency is need. And so when you live in the kingdom of God and you have a need, God is saying, oh, good. Oh, good. We're here together because, boy, I have, I'm going to multiply this like you've never seen. I'm going to get in there and do this thing. It's crazy. And I tell you, in a church, how it works in the relationship with the church is very similar to this. You guys, myself, all of our staff, we're very, uh, we're as generous as God can make us to be. We all tithe and much more than tithe in some cases and we, and we give. And what does that do? It creates a, a, a tight spot on our budget. None of us would ever give what we give to God and then say, oh good, I didn't need that 10% anyways. I didn't need that 16% anyways or whatever it might be. No, no, no. When you give it, it always hurts and it always creates a need. It always creates a need. And so you go back and you trust God. Oh, God. And when God sees that need, two things happen. He covers that need. And I'll talk a little about that in a moment here. But he covers that need. And, he, and, and I'll just say that. But on the other hand, that money goes where when you give it to the church? It comes into the church to pay the bills and to uh, fulfill the mission that we have. And let me tell you something. That money that you give here in this church is multiplied every week. Every Sunday when that money comes in, I don't know how God does it, but he does far more than what the quantity of the offering was. Far more. In every instance, in every ministry, you would say, how were you able to do it for this amount of money? Because nobody could do it on human terms. I'll tell you how we were able to do this much with excellence with this much money. 
God's money. It's God's money. It has God's blessing on it. It has God's blessing on it. That's why it's automatically multiplied when it comes to be used for God's purposes. That's how God does it. Some people are impressed about the feeding of the 5,000. I have seen that feeding of the 5,000 so many times. I still, I turn the channel. I'm so bored. I know that story. When that money comes in, God blesses that money and does far more than we could ever imagine. I love giving to God because I know for every dollar I got, give, God's going to get $100 worth of, uh, uh, of, of service out of that money. God is amazing. God is awesome when it comes to that. One of the crazy experiences I've had was I spent a couple weeks in Cali, Colombia. Now, this was not too long after all the drug world existed there in Cali, Colombia. And um, I ended up meeting so many guys that had served in prison in Miami, in Florida. It was hilarious. It seemed like the entire city was made up of people who had been in jail in the United States for drug trafficking. And, um, but, you know, they had amazing testimonies. And, and I tell you, just listening to their stories, the quantity of money these guys dealt with is mind-blowing to me. And so you get this one guy, and I finally was able to, you know, to work up a little conversation to, to ask the very obvious question. And, and I, my question was, if you had so many millions of dollars, why are you broke? Or, you know, why don't you have millions of dollars? And he looked at me like I was the dumbest guy in the world, and I was. Because what he said was, drug money is cursed money. It comes and it goes, and it takes with it. He says, there's nothing, there's never any profit from drug money. There's never anything good that comes from that. It comes and it goes and you have nothing left. I remember that. I remember that. Stolen money the very same way. People get money for illicit things by ripping people off. That is cursed money. It might come to this person in one amount, but it goes out in a completely different amount and it takes a part of the soul of that person with it. It's an awful thing. That is in stark contrast. It's the polar opposite of blessed money, of blessed money. A little money comes in and it goes out with God's blessing. And it goes out and it builds your soul when it draws you closer to God. And it draws you closer. This is part of how God does it. This is part of his economy. I want to share with you 2 Corinthians, uh, just the very uh, previous verse to it. Chapter 9, verse 10. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. Enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. Let me tell you, a lot of us spend our times counting things, counting things that are not a result of righteousness. They're a result of, of good business or they're a result of, uh, of schemes or they're a result of plans, but they're not a result of righteousness. Live a little time and you're going to realize that it's not the things you accumulate that make your life, but it's the results of a life of righteousness that make your life. When you get a little older, you look back, it's not going to be all the things you accumulated. It's going to be the relationships. It's going to be the relationships. It's going to be your relationship with God. It's going to be a relationship with your family. It's going to be your relationship with your church friends. That's, that's the result. That's the harvest. And that's what we truly want as human beings. That's what we truly want as human beings. And that's how God blesses us with that. That's how God blesses us with that. Um, and this is the third one. And this is right along with this. Be a part of God's, of God's miracle provision. Be a part of God's miracle provision. We can't do much by ourselves, can we? Can you imagine if any one of us were the only ones to put something in the offering, what would happen? <laughs> Even with God multiplying it, it wouldn't be much. But, wouldn't be enough, I should say. But when all of us together, all of us partner with each other, and all of us get in there and do the very best that we can in our relationship with God, oh, can you imagine, can you imagine we have a job to do in this city. We are surrounded by atheists and Hindus and, and people who do not know Jesus. People who do not know Jesus. People, we have a job to do, friends. God has given us this location for a reason. It's because he wants this place to shine. He wants this place to reach this community. And we reach this community, we have reached the world. We have reached some into the, some of the darkest 
darkest places on this earth, some of the places where there's the most suffering on this earth, but you reach them with Jesus and you have brought life and you have brought hope and you have brought eternity into hearts of people who never hear about Jesus. Together, together we can do amazing things for God if we would just step in and rest in God's provision, God's miracle provision. Let that be the description of your life and of my life. I had a friend and he said, you know, when you start giving to God, go downtown and buy a journal and title the journal the year and the date that you started giving to God. And then you start writing all of the miracles, all of the miracles, how God has provided for you. And you say, you know, something funny happens. At first, everything is financially related. But then something changes in your journal entries. Something changes. And what now happens, you start writing about the blessings of a life that puts God first. You start writing about how God is changing your heart and changing your life when you put God first. When you trust God with the extra, when you trust God with great expectation, the things that God opens up into your life are incomparable to anything this world has to offer. It's a powerful way. And it all begins by making sure that God is in first place in all of our lives, by making sure that we live in need of God and expectation of what God can do, and that we live with a joy of what God is doing, how he's multiplying, how he's reaching people. That's the part that God has for us. I, I love this passage here, um, Matthew 6, 21. Matthew 6, or where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Let me ask you, where is, where is your treasure? Just look in your, your, your account and it says debit or account. Where is that money going? Where's that money going? Is, is that where you want your heart to be? Is that where you want your heart? I know it's about balance and I know it's about attitude and it certainly is. But it's a very important question for all of us to ask. Where is my heart going? Where, because it follows the money. It follows the money. Where is my heart going? Is that really where I want my heart to be? Is that really where I want my heart to be? Let me tell you what, sometimes people just live in this terrible fear of, uh, of I'm not going to have enough. I, I just not going to have enough. I've got to hold on to everything. Yes, outside of God's provision, miracle provision, I agree, you probably won't have enough. Life is hard. Expenses just go up. You have all kinds of reasons to say I won't have enough. But inside, when you're inside God's provision, what you ask is very different. <laughs> you don't ask, you know, how am I ever going to have enough? You start asking, God, how can I give more? God, how can I have you more active in my life? How can I have you uh, meeting the miracles and doing amazing things in me, God? Your mindset changes. Your mindset changes from fear to blessing, from fear to faith, from fear to confidence in what God can do. Sometimes people say, oh, 10%. You know what? The government already taxes me 30%, 40%. I can't imagine, you know, some worse than that, um, and then I can't imagine taking another 10% out of my income. Uh, oh, boy. <laughs> that's true. That's, that's a thought everybody has. Until they learn about the economy, the provision of God, until they learn about that, then you know what they find? That with God's blessing on your 90%, you can do more than 100% without God's blessing. In fact, with God's blessing on the 90%, you can do far, far, far more, far more than you ever could with 100%, far more. Have God's blessing on that. Have God's blessing on that. You know, I'm not going to have enough. God says, I am enough. I am enough. I'll learn that. People say, oh, I have a, I have a problem, and, and I need X amount of money to fix it. I don't know. I'm going to tell you what. It's probably not X amount of money that's going to fix it. But I will tell you what. You do have a problem. And there's a solution, and the solution is not financial. The solution is spiritual. And if you have Jesus in your life, regardless of how it looks, God will help you through it. God will take you to the other side. I'm going to share a closing verse right here, Matthew 6, 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. I have seen this verse used as a life verse more often than I could ever imagine. But I tell you what, it's so true. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you as well. Keep God in first place. Put God in first place and watch God's blessing emerge in your life in ways that not only blesses you, but blesses this world that desperately needs a dark world. Watch God go to work through it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father. Thank you for this opportunity we've had to come and talk about something that is, is so, so real. And for some people, just a very raw thing. But Lord, thank you for the opportunity that, that you've given us to hear the truth of your word. 
to hear the truth of your economy, to hear the truth of how you deal with us. Thank you, Father, for that. Thank you, Father, for all those here who, who have already learned these lessons and put them into practice or sharing these lessons with other people that trust God first, put God in first place, need God. Make sure you're always in a posture where you need God. Watch for God's work expectantly. Thank you, Father, for this. Thank you, Lord. Help us, Lord, to expand this message, expand this, Lord, so other people can learn the lessons that we've learned so, so powerfully. Thank you, Father, for what you're doing. We look for your transformation, Father, in the lives of each person here, and we look for your transformation in our church. Father, with your anointing, with your power, help our church fulfill your purpose in this community and the world. In the name of Jesus, we pray.